thing is on mute here. All right, we should be streaming now, I hope. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. We're doing an early morning episode today rather than our typical uh, evening episode. I'm here with Dr. Leonard Sachs. I'm really excited to have you, Dr. Sachs. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, so, you know, this is a really important topic. I was in Maine a couple of months ago when we were taking a drive and we were listening to you on the radio discussing this guy who in, in New York who had sued his uh, parents and uh, began looking you up and your work and everything that you were discussing. And this, this guy, he was what, 32 or 34 and his parents had told him to get out and they had served him an eviction notice and he sued them because he had never had to do a dang thing in his life. Yeah. And of course, that's an extreme case. But the point I make in my book, Boys Adrift, is that less extreme versions of this are now very common. There are many, many families I've encountered in my 32 years as a medical doctor, and especially in the last 10 or 12 years, uh, and which I've also encountered across the United States, where the daughter is working hard, getting good grades, uh, making plans for the future, and the son is a goofball who's spending his free time playing video games and looking at pornography. <laughs> same, same parents, same family, same parenting, but very different outcomes. Uh, and why is that? And this is a big change. There's nothing hardwired about this because 40 years ago, it was common to find the reverse. Right. Uh, and this is well documented. 40 years ago, boys were outperforming girls at school boys were more likely to attend college and graduate from college uh, and the girl was more likely to be the giggly teenage goof off uh, so there's been a profound change in 40 years time that can't be due to anything hardwired dna doesn't change in 40 years so what happened uh, in the last 40 years that caused this reversal where the young women are now more likely to be motivated and hardworking. Uh, goal-oriented, and their brothers are more likely to be goofing off in the bedroom. So, uh, you know, and of course the feminists would be cheering this, you know, but one thing I would like to point out is all of this also leads to the crash in society and population we're seeing right now where, you know, women are no longer in the home raising families, the backbone of the family. They are career chasing and doing these sort of things. So, well, girls are not the winners here. And I wrote a, a book called Girls on the Edge because it turns out that the rate of anxiety and depression among girls has exploded, has quadrupled in the last 20 years. So, yeah, this uh, in this family, the girl's the high achiever and the boy's the goofball. But the girl is the one who's anxious, who's cutting herself with razor blades, who can't sleep at night. Uh, the boy is perfectly content and seems very happy. It's his parents who are pulling out their hair about the son. Uh, so there are no winners here. Uh, girls are much more likely to be anxious and depressed compared with girls 20 years ago. Boys are much more likely to be disengaged and underachieving compared to boys from the same demographic 20 years ago. American culture has become a toxic culture. And I mean that not in a pejorative sense, but in a descriptive sense. When you look at, for example, the children of immigrants uh, to the United States who don't speak English at home, those kids are much less likely to be anxious, depressed, and disengaged compared to American kids. But if they start speaking English at home as a marker of assimilation into American culture, their risk rises. This was absolutely not true of American culture 40 years ago. 40 years ago, American culture was a healthy culture. And kids who came here, if they assimilated, did better than if they did not assimilate. Today, that's not the case. And scholars call that the immigrant paradox. Uh, 40 years ago, kids born and raised in the United States did better than immigrant kids in the United States. Today, that the reverse is true. Today, immigrant kids do better than kids born and raised in the United States. Hence the phrase, the immigrant paradox, becoming American, learning to speak English, assimilating into American culture, now is a major risk factor for anxiety, depression, and disengagement. That's incredible. Um, you know, I do want to get into uh, some of your books. I wanted to start off by discussing your book, The Collapse of Parenting, How We Hurt Kids When We Treat Them Like Grown-Ups. Yeah, you know, I, hate, 
I hate the subtitle. Do you? Uh, yeah, I, I fought 12 rounds with the publisher. But the, the truth is that non-celebrity authors don't get to choose their title. <laughs> uh, the, the title of the manuscript that I sent to the publisher, the title was The Collapse of American Parenting. And the subtitle was why, bo- mo- why Most Kids Would Now Be Better Off Raised Outside the United States. But the publisher wow. didn't like that. And so we got The Collapse of Parenting and the subtitle. I, I really objected to the subtitle because many times you needed to treat your kids like grown-ups. You need to expect them to behave in a mature and responsible way. So I, I really objected to that subtitle. Uh, but as I said, uh, if you're not a celebrity, you don't get to choose your title. Or your well, title. you know, one thing I've noticed that came out of the New Age, Esalen, uh, sort of SR, SRI crowd in the 70s was the children's mind. You were, the child was born with an adult mind, but it was just a blank slate that needed to be filled. When you know, anybody who's a parent realizes that, you know, when a child goes from one to two, there's stages of development from two to three, from three to four. You know, and when my son uh, just turned four, suddenly it was like maybe a couple few weeks before his fourth fir- birthday. Suddenly he could begin to understand abstract concepts, whereas at two and three he couldn't. And then, you know, when you would explain things, he would actually begin to understand at that point. And I, th- you know, I always saw a real problem with oh, their their minds are the same as an adult. It's just a blank slate. Yeah, well, that of course was uh, just empirically false and not valid as a description of of uh, a infant or a toddler. But as many anthropologists have observed, our culture is constantly being invaded by barbarians. And what they mean when they say that is that the invaders are infants. A newborn today has essentially the same DNA as a newborn 10,000 or 20,000 years ago. This is what the genetics people tell us. In other words, that child born today would be perfectly comfortable and at home in a barbarian culture of hunting and fighting. Uh, But we don't want them to grow up to be a barbarian hunter and fighter. We want them to be civilized. Well, that means the parent has to do a lot of work. I mean, what is childhood for? Look, a four-year-old horse is a mature adult. A four-year-old human has barely begun. And a a horse is a bigger animal than a human. Why is human childhood so long? Humans are developing for more years than most mammals live. Why? Well, we don't have to guess. We have researchers who study this. And they tell us that the reason human childhood is as long as it is, is because it takes many years for the grown-ups to teach the kid what the kid needs to know in order to be civilized in that culture. And we used to understand that. We used to understand that the function of the parent is to teach the child. In the same page where I mentioned that on the Collapse of Parenting, page 134, I cite a regular columnist for the New York Times, Jennifer Finney Boylan, who wrote a column about what is enlightened parenting. And she said enlightened parenting means setting your child free to discover for themselves their own right and wrong. And if in so doing they become a stranger to you, then so be it, quote, unquote. Now, that may sound enlightened, but it's not. It's a dereliction of duty. Correct. If you set your child free to discover for themselves their own right and wrong, and they live in the United States and they speak English, what they will discover is Akon, Eminem, 50 Cent, Bruno Mars, Miley Cyrus, Justin Bieber, <laughs> Caitlyn Jenner, and mainstream pornography. And you will have a child who is adrift. If she's a daughter, she's likely to be anxious and depressed. If she, if you have a son, he's likely to be disengaged, playing out testosterone-fueled fantasies of violence and pornography in his bedroom. Right. Well, you know, and I call this extended adolescence or arrested development. And where children used to be grown up in their late teens, early 20s today, you know, and when you're a parent, you... <clears throat> reach a new level when your child is born of understanding. It's like, whoa, I just created this thing, and you're no longer the adolescent. And then when you reach the age of grandparent, you, I'm, I'm assuming you would reach a whole nother level of understanding. But what all of this plays into is moral relativism. And, you know, you have 
uh, lies and deception and poor behavior on one side, which are clearly wrong, and then you have truth, honesty, proper behavior on the on the right, doing right. That's why it's called the right, <laughs> doing correct behavior, and you know. So when you leave a child to just do whatever on their own, and now you see uh, them promoting child uh, sexualization and all of this stuff as well, and. And now I see them uh, even promoting attempts at legalizing pedophilia and all of this stuff where, you know, children have no ability to make these decisions at a young age and they need proper guidance, proper boundaries. And that's the role mostly of the father. And of course, you push the father out and then they don't have a proper role model and the fathers are fallen. Many, in many cases, they don't even understand these things anymore. Well, sir, I have to take issue with your quick uh comment about the father mother and father both have important roles well, well very i'm not saying they don't have important roles but mothers ten, you know fathers especially alpha males they tend to set boundaries of you know and of course mothers do this also i'm not n not saying mothers don't but yeah. it's but well empirically i mean again researchers have looked at this in the united states and what they're finding is that right now we're not living in the Andrew Griffith show. We're living in the United States in 2018. And in contemporary American culture, it is the mothers. It's Al, it's Al Bundy is the father or uh, Homer that, Simpson. Yeah, and that, That's right. The mother is much more likely to be enforcing the rules. And the father is more likely to say, ah, oh, knock it off. Don't worry about it. That's what's happening right now in American culture. That is the mode is that mom is the is more likely to be the strict parent and dad is goofing off. <laughs> well, and, and that's, you know, exactly my point about the the collapse of fathers not even doing this role anymore. But um, can you talk about the uh, vacuum of authority in current society? Yeah. Uh, so kids need guidance. Kids need structure. Kids need, a <clears throat> excuse me, Kids need a clear sense of what is right and wrong. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for parents to teach them. But when parents step away from that role, when parents let kids decide, and that's, of course, where the publisher is coming from. They didn't invent that out of whole cloth. In many domains, kids should not be making the decisions. Uh, but I find many parents who are now letting kids make choices that really should be made by the parents, uh, such as, is it okay for a kid to take their cell phone to bed with them? And parents are saying things like, you know, I don't think it's a good idea, but you know, you do you, you know, I trust you to make good choices. And what's happening is that this 14 year old girl's got her phone in the bedroom and at two in the morning, she's getting a text. OMG, Jason and Emily just broke up. This is really big news. We all have to talk about this. And the parents are astonished to find that half the 10th grade class is online and texting at two in the morning. This has to be the parents' call. Uh, and I tell parents, and look, at nine o'clock at night, the very latest, you say to the kid, device is off, fork it over. You take the device, you put it in the charger, which stays in the parents' bedroom. They can have it back tomorrow morning. This has to be the parent's call. What is your daughter supposed to say tomorrow in school when her friend says, hey, I texted you last night at midnight. How come you didn't answer? Is your daughter supposed to say, well, researchers have found that sleep deprivation in adolescence is a major risk factor. In the <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. You can't expect a 14-year-old girl to say that. You have to allow her to say, hey, my evil parents take my phone every night at nine. They won't have it back till the next morning. This is your job as a parent. But because so many American parents are confused on this point, you've got an, an, an explosion of sleep deprivation among American teenagers, again, well documented, because she's staying up past midnight, posting selfies on Instagram and texting, and her brother is staying up past midnight playing Fortnite Battle Royale. Uh, and both the boys and girls are sleep deprived. Right. What can you say about uh, selfie culture, especially among teenage girls? So I meet with students and I talk with them about that. And I'm always referring to longitudinal cohort studies because I think they're of immense power. A longitudinal cohort study means you, the researchers recruit a thousand or 2000 kids at 12 years of age, and then they follow them for 10 or 20 years. 
So these studies take 20 years to conduct. There, it's a huge investment of time and energy, but they're so valuable because what you find, you can determine what predicts health, wealth, and happiness 20 years down the road. What predicts health, wealth, and happiness in a 12-year-old looking 20 years down the road? It's not self-esteem. It's not grades. It's character. It's humility and conscientiousness. Well, what does humility mean? I'll meet with, I'll meet with the students. I'll say, all right, so these researchers found that humility was a great predictor of health and wealth and happiness 20 years down the road. What is humility? I, I say, any one of you, raise your hand, I'll call on you. And when I meet with the kids, it's always a conversation. I pose questions and I, and I call on kids who have their hands raised. And a boy raises his hand, raised his hand, and I called him and the boy said, humility means <clears throat> Excuse me. Humility means trying to convince yourself you're dumb when you know you're smart. I said, actually, oh, wow. Actually, that's not humility. That is psychosis. Okay? That is <laughs> attachment from reality. I said, humility means being as interested in other people as you are in yourself. The kids are giving me a blank look. They have never heard this before. They're American kids raised in the United States. They have never once in their lives heard anything about the virtue of humility. And this gets to your question, what is Instagram? The way kids use Instagram, researchers find, it's all about me. Here I am at the mall. Here I am at Starbucks with my friends. Here I am picking my nose, me, 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 in the pursuit of likes and followers and to anxiety and depression. This is not a guess, it's not a sermon, it's a robust empirical finding. The more time kids are involved, the more time kids spend on Instagram looking to see how many other kids like their post <clears throat> and looking, to, looking at other kids' posts, the more likely they are to become depressed, again, in longitudinal cohort studies. So yeah, again, It's a, it's, it's a false self-esteem. Well, it's very fragile. And I tell parents that you must limit, govern, and guide how much time your kids are spending on Instagram. 20 minutes a day is plenty to get online, respond to your messages, and get off. And I think that's a pretty good rule. Uh, talk about the uh, question authority paradigm. That was kind of kicked off by Leary and the Harvard crowd. Well, indeed, authority. And, and a, a, a term from the same 1960s era, is you're going to worship somebody. You better be careful in choosing. You better you, you better worship a, a drug dealer leader like Leary. Well, <laughs> well, we are all looking for guidance. What is right? What is wrong? And how do you know? And if you don't think carefully about those issues, you may find yourself just following the current. And the current in current American culture is really toxic and harmful to kids because uh, it gives them no guidance. Uh, so indeed, as you point out, there's been a huge move in the United States over the last 50 years to question authority. And I understand that. And I, I, I see where that comes from. You know, in 1960, the great majority of Americans said you could trust the government to do the right thing almost all the time. Today, the great majority of Americans say you cannot trust the government to do the right thing most of the time. And I understand that. I'm not suggesting that you should trust the government or politicians or the church. Uh, 50 years ago, a Catholic priest uh, coming to a public golf cart course where I grew up in Northern Ohio would be escorted to the front of the line because he was a Roman Catholic priest. Today, a Catholic priest told me recently, he got onto an elevator and a mother clutched her son more closely to her side because he was a Catholic priest. She was suspicious of him. Okay, fine. That's not what I'm talking about. People have become suspicious of authority in all domains. Okay, I get it. But there's one domain where you must respect authority, and that is in the parent-child relationship. Because the parent-child relationship is unique. 
the parent must teach right and wrong to the child. And that requires authority. If you approach the parent-child relationship the same as you approach other relationships in contemporary American culture, which is, hey, we're all equal here, uh, how do you teach your child not to cheat on a test? Well, what many American parents say today is literally something like, you know, I, I wouldn't cheat because, you know, that's just not my thing. But, you know, you do you, you know, you, you, you do you, whatever feels right to you. And the result, not surprisingly, is an explosion in cheating among American kids. Right. The parent must say it is wrong to cheat. I would rather you get a C on the test, honestly, than cheat it's and get lying. an A. You can never cheat. Lying is wrong no matter what. Um, and parents used to understand that. Parents used to say things like, I'd rather you get a C on the test honestly than cheat and get an A. And yet American parents today, and especially affluent parents, are likely to say to their kid, hey, you want to get into Yale? You want to get into Stanford? You got to have amazing grades because you're competing against kids from Asia and Europe now. And as I said, there's been an explosion in, in cheating among American kids. When I was a kid, which is very different with my son and I, uh, but when I was a kid, it was because I said so. You want to talk about that? Indeed. Yes, because I said so. So I was talking to some parents in Chappaqua, New York, which is an affluent suburb of New York City. And a uh, husband told me, father told me how he and his wife made a healthy, nutritious supper for their, their uh, son and daughter. And son and daughter came home and said, oh, yuck, we don't want to eat that. Can we just order pizza? And father said, sure, and sat down at the computer and ordered Domino's pizza to the dictates of his son and daughter, who each got a different pizza. And I said to the father, why, why did you do that? Why didn't you just tell them this is what's for supper? And dad said, well, I don't, I don't believe in using starvation as a means of discipline. I said, they're not going to starve. Look, 30 years ago, if mom made a healthy, nutritious supper and the kids didn't like it, mom would say, okay, you can go to bed hungry. Right. Why? Because I'm your mother. That's why. Uh, she would not run out and buy them a pizza. Uh, but today, many American parents are uncertain, unsure of their own authority. They question authority in all domains, including in their own role as a parent. They it's, don't feel it's they really have pathetic. To... It's just you make the meal and you say, here's dinner and I've prepared this for you. If you don't appreciate it, don't eat it and go to bed hungry. Well, and the result, as I point out, it, I devote a chapter of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, to the explosion in obesity among American kids. In Absolutely. 1971%, 4% of American kids were obese in 1971. Today, 17% of American kids are obese. The rate has more than quadrupled uh, since 1971. Why? Well, there, there are three reasons why, but one of those three reasons is that many parents now let kids choose what's for supper. They literally ask their kids, what's for supper? What would you like for supper? And then they make what the kids make. Well, if you, if you ask a 12-year-old, what do you want for supper? There are some 12-year-olds who will say broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, spinach, asparagus, and kale. But there are also many 12-year-olds who will say French fries, potato chips, ice cream, and pizza. Right. 12-year-olds are not competent to decide what's for supper. That's why they have parents. But when parents <laughs> let kids make that call one consequence is a lot more overweight kids right and and you know and then you have this society of snack of snacking and you so then they're eating all of this wheat gluten and sugar stuff which of course is going to lead to obesity when i was a kid if you ate bread and cake and ice cream and this stuff you knew you were going to be obese today i actually hear parents that don't even know that cake and sugar leads to obesity while they're stuffing it down their children's throats. No, I don't buy that. They know. Oh, I've actually, that, I've they, actually met some parents that literally did not know sugar well, and the stuff was bad. That's unusual. The parents know, most parents know that cake is not a good snack uh, for a child or teenager, but that's what the kids want. And parents feel like, well, I, I need to let them make their own choices because uh, I read in a book that uh, good parenting means letting kids make their own choices. Jennifer Finney Boylan for the New York Times says you set your child free to, to make their own choices. Uh, 
Well, yeah, in some domains, but not in all domains without any constraint. Uh, and you need to teach your child good habits. You need to inculcate good habits. And I see parents who are literally putting a cooler of snacks in their car for the ride to school. And I'll ask them why. And they'll say, well, I don't want my child to get hypoglycemic. Uh, <laughs> so you give them sugary snacks. <laughs> uh, look, kids need to have periods of not eating. Again, this is not a uh, guess. We have good research showing that when kids are, quote, grazing all day long, you greatly increase uh, impaired glucose tolerance, prediabetes, and overweight. This is sure. a robust empirical finding. Kids should not be snacking all day long. And the funny thing is parents used to know this 30 years ago before we had the research. Now we have the research, but parents don't know it. Right. And, and they're encouraging and, or at least allowing their kids to snack continually. Well, you know, and if you focus on the ketogenic diet, they should be able to make it from breakfast until 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon without even feeling any hunger. Well, you know? the, the ketogenic diet is controversial. The idea of giving bacon and sausage to kids every day. Um, well, I, I've done. We can uh, talk about the pros yeah. and cons. But I, that's I've done a lot of research on it, and I've been on the ketogenic diet for five years. And I was in and out of hospitals for fifteen years, and I've promoted on my show for a number of years. And I've seen from the audience the feedback and the emails. Of course, it's um, you know uh, speculative evidence, but I've not had one person tell me that they didn't have dramatic results. And I've interviewed a number of doctors about this as well. And we see it across the board, how it's really dramatically benefited people. But, you know, I haven't been on meds or in the hospital since 2009 from being on the ketogenic diet. And all of my health problems have cleared up. But that's a well, segue. We, we can agree that, that cake and candy uh, and sweet treats are not best practice for kids. Uh, that's the Definitely. point I think we can both agree on. And yet that's a point where many American parents, while they might say, oh yeah, I, I know that, but you know, I think I let, need to let my kid decide because uh, good parenting means letting kids make good choices, right? Um, and, and they're so confused. Let's talk about do unto others. You know, how would you feel if someone did that uh, to you? Yeah, so uh, as recently as 20 years, again, I've been a medical doctor in the United States uh, for 32 years. As recently as 20 years ago, parents were, American parents were pretty comfortable saying, do unto others. Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> That's not a suggestion. We both have our contigos. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, that's not a suggestion. That's a command. But over the last 20 years, I have seen that command soften, morph into a question. And the question is often something like, well, how, how would you feel if someone did that to you? And the parent has no idea what to say when their son responds. If someone did that to me, I'd kick him in the nuts and then I'd sit on his face. I have witnessed firsthand the collapse of American parenting. It is the job of the parent. So if I may, in the, in the uh, book, I quote from the Hebrew Bible, uh, Deuteronomy chapter six, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words, which I command you this day shall be upon your heart and, and what? The next line is usually translated as teach them diligently to your children. That's not even close to what the Hebrew says. It would be easy to say that in biblical Hebrew. The verb would be lamed, but the Hebrew verb there is not lamed. It is shanan, mishinantan v'necha. What does shanan mean? Shanan means to chisel in stone. So a better translation there would be incise them on the hearts of your children because the writer understands that, look, kids are not born knowing right and wrong. They have to be taught and and. Teaching them is not a matter of saying, you do you. Teaching them requires that you very firmly insist this is right and this is wrong. And in order to accomplish that, you must teach from a position of authority. And if you abandon that authority and you say, well, this is my opinion, what do you think? You're not teaching anything. That's not how you teach right and wrong. 
<clears throat> so are parents supposed to be the friends of the children or the parents? Well, again, so many American parents are confused on this point. And we do get tripped up by the language because, of course, you want to be friendly with your child. You want to enjoy the time you have with your child. I devote a chapter of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, is titled Enjoy, How to Have Fun with Your Child. And you might think, well, that's banal. Every parent knows how to have fun with their child. No, they don't. And increasingly among middle income and affluent parents, you find that the time they're spending with their child is driving them to play dates or drilling them on their Spanish grammar or driving them to soccer practice. And some researchers compared American parents with French parents, and they found that French parents enjoy being parents much more than American parents do. Uh, many American parents do not enjoy the time they're spending with their kid. So one of the points I make in the book is you must set aside time every week to do something fun with your kid, whether it's a bike ride on the bike trail or uh, playing a game together or going for a walk in the park. You've got to spend set aside hours each week when you're just doing fun stuff together. And again, American parents do not do this many of them, and they should. Uh, but that doesn't mean you are your child's best friend. And again, American parents are very confused on this point. And many parents have told me they want to be their kid's best friend. No, you don't. Because a friend is a peer. A friend cannot command. A friend cannot say, I'm taking your phone from you at nine o'clock at night tonight so you can get some sleep and not be texting at two in the morning. A friend cannot say that, but a parent can say that. A friend cannot say, I will not allow you to pig out on ice cream right before supper. A friend cannot say that. A parent can say that. Only a parent can say that. Look, over my 32 years of, of being a medical doctor in the United States, I have been involved in a handful of cases of sexual assault either as a consulting physician or attending physician with a teenage girl as a victim. In one case, my only role was to sit with mom in the consultation room at Shady Grove Adventist Hospital, right next to the ER, while the uh, forensic exam on her daughter was concluding. Her daughter had been a victim of sexual assault. And when I came into the room, it was just mom and me, and mom said, her first words to me, she said, I knew I shouldn't have let her go. She's 15 years old. It was a frat party at the college. I knew I shouldn't have let her go. And you want to shake mom and grab her and say, well, then why'd you let her go? But I didn't do that because I knew the answer. She wants to be her daughter's best friend. And her daughter had said she really wanted to do this. All of her friends were going. And so her mom let her go because a friend cannot command. A friend cannot say, no, you're not allowed. Better example of good parenting comes from a mom I was talking to in Tampa, Florida. Her daughter, her 14 year old daughter came to her and said, hey, uh, I'm, I'm going to Cancun for spring break. Um, and mom said, what? She said, yeah, all, all of us girls were going to Cancun for spring break. Now, that happens to be a very affluent family, so mom couldn't say they couldn't afford it. That would not have been plausible. And mom looked at her calendar and said, well, I, ca I can't get away that week. And her daughter said, I didn't say you were going. I'm going. And mom said, you're 14 years old. You're going to Cancun, Mexico without any grownups? She, yeah, I don't think it's safe. And her daughter said, oh, it's fine. We'll be totally safe. We'll find, we'll be, we'll stay together. We'll have our phones. We'll be fine. And her mom said, no, you're not going. And she told me her, her daughter exploded. Her daughter started screaming at her. Her daughter said, you're going to like totally ruin my whole life. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. And mom said, well, to be honest, sometimes I'm not so fond of you either. She said, but I'm your mom. That's a job, has a job description. Item number one on my job description is I have to keep you safe. And I know more than you do about the behavior of drunk 20 year old men. 
and you, you're 14, but you could easily pass for 18, and a drunk 20-year-old man is not going to ask you to show ID. It's not safe. You're not going. If you're doing the right thing as a parent, you will do things that your child does not approve of. That's part of your job. And when you say, no, 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 I want to be my daughter's best friend, and you abdicate that responsibility of being the parent, bad things are more likely to happen. Let's uh, talk about how shows, TV, television is uh, degrading and undermining the role of parents and family. Oh, yeah. So again, that's another focus. Uh, in my book, The Collapse of Parenting, I've reviewed the, the 150 most popular television shows in the United States right now. Not one of them consistently or even often portrays a parent as knowledgeable, competent, thoughtful, reliable, productive. That's a huge change. Uh, 1960s, uh, you got uh, the most popular shows are shows like Andy Griffith's show. 1980s, most popular shows are shows like Family Ties. In those shows, the parents are consistently knowledgeable, competent, reliable, thoughtful, productive, and kind. But today, you look at the most popular TV shows, shows like The Simpsons, Homer Simpson is a bum. He's an idiot. He's not a reliable guide. Even on the Disney Channel, uh, shows like Dog with a Blog, uh, uh, Live and Maddie, uh, these are shows where the parents are idiots. They're out of touch. They're clueless. The talking dog in Dog with a, Do a Blog is a much more uh, reliable guide than the father, who's supposedly a school psychologist, but knows nothing about what kids want or what kids need. This is characteristic of American culture now on just about every channel, from the Disney Channel to ABC to CBS, etc. cetera. Uh, parents are uh, portrayed as out of touch, clueless, laughable. Uh, modern family, the straight dad is a total idiot uh and we laugh at him and we are expected to laugh at him his three kids are much wiser and more insightful than the father is this is characteristic of american culture today and it's quite new you know and i think it's probably rather intentional i mean uh how can you have all of these tv shows promoting the father is an idiot parents are idiots the children as the authority and then we see it over a generation rolling out, you know, and I, you know, maybe that's a little too much to think of it in terms of social engineering, but I suspect as much. Well, well, kids, again, are not born knowing what is right and wrong. They're not born knowing that you should respect and honor your mother and father. They are not born knowing that. They have to be taught. And if instead they're watching the Disney Channel, where they see kids defying and disrespecting their parents and getting big laughs from the audience for doing that, that's what they will do. And more than once, parents have told me, uh, I, I advise parents, the Disney Channel is not allowed. Do not allow your kids to watch the Disney Channel. It teaches disrespect. They can watch the Cooking Channel. They can watch uh, any of the Science Channels. They can watch Discovery. But they should not watch the Disney Channel because it teaches kids to disrespect their, their parents. And within a month's time, parents tell me the kids are behaving better. Wow. They just are, just from cutting uh, out the Disney just Channel. From cutting out the Disney Channel. It really matters. You know, in the last 10 years, we've had TV maybe for a month. And uh, so nobody watched it in the month that we had it. And then two months after I had the cable shut off, my son comes to me and says, what happened to the cable? I said, well, I turned it off about three months ago, <laughs> two months ago. You just now noticed it, you know, so clearly you didn't need it. But, you know, usually if my son is quiet, you know, and I come down, OK, what's he doing? What's he up to? And he's in his room reading a book. Well, good for you. And I commend you. Uh, the pushback I get from my daughter about the limitations we have is that well everybody else at school is watching the show everybody else on school is on instagram and i say i understand but it's too bad yeah well and that's for their own detriment my son has uh, heard my show sorry to interrupt you my son has heard my show for years also 
and he's uh, you know he he just turned 12 a few weeks ago and he's beginning to see all of the stuff that dad's always talking about and having interviews like you on and and whatnot and he he's beginning to understand all of this on his own well and other parents will say but dr Sachs, if i follow the guidelines that you lay out my kid won't be popular because because <laughs> you're telling them not to do the things that the popular kids do and i say you're absolutely right your child will not be the most popular kid what do we know about the most popular kid well, we've got a great longitudinal cohort study in which researchers followed 13 year olds who were the most popular among their 13 year old kids and found that six years later at age 19 being being the most popular kid in the united states today at age 13 is now a major risk factor for drug and alcohol use anxiety and depression six years later because what does it mean to be the most popular kid at age 13 it means that you are defiant you are disrespectful you have no strong bonds with parents you care mostly what other kids think and we have a great deal of research saying that when you cut the bonds across generations and kids are now looking to other kids for validation, that greatly increases the risk of anxiety, depression, and drug and alcohol use. Wow. You don't want your kid to be the most popular kid. You want your kid to have strong connections to adults, not just parents, but to adults in your community. Strong and, bonds across generations. You know, we've talked in general about this, but how has parenting changed for the worse? Well, I just alluded to the fact, again, so uh, in writing my book, Boys Adrift, I talked to comparative anthropologists, uh, and especially David Gilmour, professor at State University of New York at Stony Brook, who has spent his life studying how different people have lived in different times, different places. And I asked him, What's a characteristic of enduring cultures, the cultures that last for thousands of years? Is there something they all have in common? Yes, there is. Strong bonds across generations. Wow. Strong bonds across generations. And the funny thing is we used to have that in the United States. Uh, again, this is not a guess or nostalgia. We've got scholars like Robert Putnam at Harvard who has spent 20 years documenting what he calls the collapse of American community. And by community, he means bonds across generations. 50 years ago, you could go into any neighborhood in the United States and you'd find a sewing circle. And he, his students have dug up, his graduate students dig up, who was in the sewing circle in Shaker Heights, Ohio in 1966? Well, on this block, there were older women, younger women and girls organized not by kin relation, but by geographic proximity, which is a fancy way of saying they weren't related to each other. They just happened to live on the same block. And that was true everywhere. And you found a group of men working under the hood of a car. And 50 years ago in Minot, North Dakota, that group of men was older men, younger men, and teenage boys. You drive around today in an American neighborhood, you might find two old geezers working under the hood of their 65 Corvette, but the teenage boys are not with them. The right. teenage boys are more likely to be indoors playing video games. The bonds across generations have been broken. We must restore them. You can't do that nationwide, but you can do it in your own home. You must prioritize the family. The parent-child bond has to be a higher priority than the bond between kids and other kids. And again, American parents no longer understand this. I find parents of seven-year-olds who, I, I tell the parents, you have to have a Saturday afternoon with your kids. And they say, well, no, I can't do that because I'm driving them to a play date. And I say to the parents, cancel the play date, make a family date instead. It's much more important for your seven-year-old to spend their Saturday afternoon with you than to spend it with a bunch of seven-year-olds. Right. You know, and back to your point earlier about, you know, trying to do at least one uh, thing, you know, outing, fun thing. Fun thing. Yeah. You know, I try to do that with my son, whether it's a hike or, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, camping, stuff like that. Try to do something like that at least, you know, once a week. Um, do children today understand what being a gentleman or lady means? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You clearly read the books. Um because that's something I talk about in several of my books, that we must teach girls and boys to be ladies and gentlemen. What does that mean? So again, when I meet with uh, teenagers, I will often say, 
What does it mean to be a gentleman? Anyone, raise your hand. What, what is a gentleman? And so I was in Crawfordsville, Indiana, and called on a teenage boy who had his hand raised, and he said, a gentleman is someone who goes to gentlemen's clubs to watch women take their clothes off. I said, okay, that's, that's, that was very funny. Now, anyone want to venture a more serious answer to the question? So I call another boy. He says, a gentleman wears a three-piece suit. It's all about surface. A gentleman wears a three-piece suit. It's all about how he looks. They have received no instruction. I'm not picking on these kids. How should they know if they have received no instruction? No one has ever explained to them that a gentleman stands up for the weak. A gentleman defends the poor. A gentleman values others. A gentleman serves others. No one has taught them this. How about chivalry? Well, again, they, they've they heard about opening a door, but the notion of actually doing something substantive, of putting someone else's needs before your own, no one has ever told them that. No one has ever suggested that a lady does not post photos of herself topless on Instagram for strangers. That's not something a lady would do. Uh, on the contrary, they are immersed in a culture of Miley Cyrus um, and Nicki Minaj, which is all about provocative photos and getting a million followers on Instagram. How are they to know that that is not the road to health and happiness? No one has taught them. Wow. We must teach them. Um, so, but people get upset. So, uh, again, a columnist from the New York Times. Uh, wrote about how offended she was that the teacher at her school dared to use the term ladies and gentlemen. The teacher had said, I want all of you to be ladies and gentlemen. And when her son came home and mentioned this, the columnist was infuriated and wrote uh, an article published in the New York Times about how terrible this is and this teacher should be fired or at least re-educated in the North Vietnamese sense of re-educated. Um, that is severely disciplined for using the term ladies and gentlemen, because she said that is that is simply reinforcing the heterosexist, heteronormative patriarchy, uh, uh, which we all know is, is the source of all evil. She said, we don't <laughs> want to, to suggest to girls and boys that the obligations of good citizenship differ between girls and boys. They do not. We want to teach them that everyone should be a good citizen. Well, the same week that that article was published, a jury in Steubenville, Ohio, convicted two teenage boys of rape. And, the, and these boys had sexually assaulted a girl who was unconscious, who was drunk. And the boys had no idea that they had done anything wrong. The attorney general, Mike DeWine, uh, Ohio Attorney General said, talking to the boys, what was most astonishing was that the boys had no moral sense, no concept that they had done anything wrong. And neither did the other boys who had, who had uh, videoed this on their phones. No sense of right and wrong. Look, boys and girls are subject to different temptations. If you Google the phrase, drunk, girl, unconscious, violated. You will find literally millions of porn sites that are devoted to men who want to watch drunk girls who are violated. Very few girls want to watch videos of unconscious boys being violated. Girls and boys are subject to different temptations. When I meet with teenagers and I say, okay, who here would like to spend their whole Saturday masturbating over pornography? Many of the boys will say, excellent, way cool. That sounds like the best thing. And girls are like, yuck. Who would, no normal person would want to do that. Girls and boys are subject to different temptations. And we used to know that. And we used to teach boys that a gentleman never touches a girl when she is unconscious, that a gentleman will defend a girl who is unconscious, that a gentleman will take that girl home and make sure she is safe in bed and that the door is locked. We used to teach boys that, we no longer do. And the result is not virtuous citizens, as the New York Times columnist would like to believe. The result is skanks 
and pimps. And I wrote an essay for Psychology Today entitled Ladies and Gentlemen or Skanks and Pimps. If you don't teach girls and boys to be ladies and gentlemen, what you end up with empirically in today's American culture is skanks and pimps. Skanks meaning girls who think it's cool to post half-dressed photos of themselves on Instagram and pimps meaning boys who see nothing wrong in molesting a girl who's unconscious. You know, uh, several years ago, and I recommend the audience go back through the archives and find it, but I interviewed uh, Gary Wilson on porn, and the episode is called This Is Your Brain on Porn. And porn is a destroyer of relationships. It ca it causes absolute havoc on men, etc. And uh, so I definitely recommend people getting a deep understanding of how bad pornography really is. But But that's just a part of a bigger truth here which is that human nature is not innately good. If you let kids do whatever they want, what you end up with is boys spending 20 hours a week or more on video games and pornography. Wow. They have to be taught. And if you don't teach them, the results are not good. And that's a point I present at great length in my book, Boys Adrift. All right, what happened, you know, and this is something that is close to home for me. Now, I always ate at the table with my family growing up. And I, my son, except for maybe a few times, like I said, he's now 12, except for maybe a, a handful of times, we've always sat down at, at the dinner table as a family for every meal. And uh, several years ago, I was dating this woman, and she had a five-year-old son. And until I came along... The son had never, not once, eaten at the dinner table with the family, and he had no manners whatsoever. And, of course, uh, they were all about, well, you know, we have to let the child choose what's right for him and all this, but he had no manners. He could not sit at the table without picking his nose, banging, clanging, just spinning around, acting like a, a, you know, a, a madman. And he was, you know, five years old, never once ate at the table with his family. Yeah, unfortunately, that kind of story is becoming more common. As I said earlier, kids are innately barbarians. Uh, human DNA hasn't changed in 20 years. If you want them to be civilized, you will have to teach them what that means to be civilized. And we've got a lot of research, which I share in my book, The Collapse of Parenting, specifically on the benefits of an evening meal. So Frank Elgar and his colleagues interviewed more than 10,000 adolescents coast to coast and ask them, okay, in the last seven days, how many evening meals have you had at home with a parent? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. And for each of these adolescents, they did comprehensive psychological assessment to determine for each kid anxiety, depression, uh, self-concept, pro-social behavior, and they found a huge effect, not just comparing zero to seven, but at almost every step along the way, just comparing five meals a week with a parent to six meals a week with a parent, going from five to six, you see a significant decrease in anxiety and depression, a significant increase in pro-social behavior and life satisfaction. You have to fight for every meal at home. It should be a top priority to have meals at home as a family. And yet I find many families, including affluent families in the United States, who are picking up their kids from the private school, driving them to a play date, driving them from the play date to computer coding class, driving them from computer coding class to the, uh, the ice hockey rink, and they're eating in the car on the way from one of these activities to another. And in the unintended message, is the time at home with family is the lowest priority of all. And that's a, a very harmful message. Cancel the play date. Have time at home with family instead. What about uh, parents who prepare their children more for school rather than for life? Well, indeed. Uh, and the kids are getting this message. That, uh, I'll ask kids, what is school? Four. What's the point? And American kids, overwhelmingly, teenagers will say it's to get into a good college. Then I'll say, well, what's college for? They'll say to, to get a good job. I'll say, well, what's, what's that for? What's the point of having a good job? They'll say to make lots of money. 
I said, what's that for? What's the point of making lots of money? To have fun. Okay. So I met with Dr. Wright, head of uh, Shore, which is a uh, private school in Sydney, Australia. And he had hired me to spend two days at the school and, and much of which I was going to just be talking with the boys. And he, I, I explained, I asked these questions and the boys answer and it's a boys school. Um, and he said, try it out on me. Ask me the questions you're going to ask the boys tomorrow. And I said, all right, what is school for? And he said, it is preparation for life. It's not preparation to get into a good college necessarily. It's preparation for life, which is quite different. I said, all right, what is life for? And he answered without hesitation. He said, life is for three things. Meaningful work, number one. Meaningful work, number two. A cause to embrace. Number three, a person to love. I said, Oh, that's an answer. I'm not saying it's the answer, but that's an answer. The last chapter of my book, The Collapse of Parenting, is titled The Meaning of Life. What I'm trying to communicate there is you must teach your child. You must instill in your child a sense of the big picture. What is life for? And it's got to be better than getting into Stanford or earning a lot of money because that will not satisfy. And I have met many uh, graduates of elite colleges and many people earning a lot of money who are miserable. They're working hard at a job they don't like, earning a ton of money and they are unhappy because they have never figured out what is life for? You must teach your child what is life for. Dr. Wright's answer, meaningful work, a cause to embrace, person to love. That's an answer. I'm not saying it's the only answer, but that's what an answer feels like. You need to teach your child something like that. And instead, many American parents, it's all about getting good marks, getting good grades, getting into Princeton. And the result is a race to nowhere, borrowing the title of the film, making that point. If, if that's all it's about, it's a rat race and the result is anxiety depression and disengagement wow let's shift gears a little bit i want to get back to this uh case in new york where the you know the kid sued his parents say he's 32 years old or whatever and sues his parents because they had to evict him and uh, he had never done a thing in his life um, what can you say not only to parents involved in these situations but to especially sons who are living at home, pampered, don't have to work, don't have to do anything. They're in their late 20s, early 30s, et cetera. You know, what, what can we say to both groups here? Yeah. The most discouraging email I get is the email from the parent who says, my son is not working. He's not looking for work. He works a few hours at the coffee shop to earn pocket money for his video games. Um, but he is not motivated and he's 32 years old. Look, I don't make guesses. I make recommendations to parents based either in my clinical experience or based on the scholarly research. What intervention can I recommend that is reliably effective for that 32 year old man, I got nothing. There is no intervention. It's too late. Look, the brain researchers find that the brain of the girl is, is mature, uh, anatomically mature. Girls reach full maturity in terms of brain development by about 22 years of age. Boys, not until 30 years of age. So if a parent emails me or contacts me and their son is 11 years old or 15 years old or 19 years old. There are many interventions I can offer that have been reliably effective for the 11 year old, the 15 year old, the 19 year old. But once that individual is 32 years old, it's too late. He's cooked. The analogy I give is to baking a cake. 
suppose you're baking a cake and you've just put the cake in the oven and you realize, oh my goodness, I forgot the vanilla extract. You just put the cake in the oven. You can still take the cake out, put the vanilla extract in the batter, stir it around, and it'll be okay. But suppose the cake is fully baked and you take it out of the oven and you think, oh, I forgot the vanilla extract. And now you pour the vanilla extract on top of the baked cake. You will not make the cake better. You'll make it worse. Interventions which work for an 11-year-old will not work for a 32-year-old. And that's what the parents of that 30-something uh, man did not understand, that they should have taken those strong steps 20 years earlier. Right. Now he's in his 30s. It's too late. I don't. I have nothing to offer the parent of the 32-year-old. Now, what a, what about uh, a 32-year-old that's listening to this show right now, and they are it's starting to click in their head? Is there anything that they can do to get motivated on their well, own? Well, at the risk of sounding uh, blatantly commercial, I would encourage them to read my book, Voice Adrift. And it will encourage them in one respect, that they are not alone, that there is a growing cohort of young American men who are drifting, who are not fulfilling their potential. And it will give them a good insight into the five factors driving this. And I have been contacted by men in their 20s and 30s who said, your book changed my life. That after I read your book, I took a baseball bat to my Xbox and destroyed it and threw out all the video games and stop looking at porn and i've started to rebuild my life i wish i had done this 10 years ago but better to do it age 33 than never um, ultimately each of us has a choice moral choice is real again quoting from uh, when i speak to the kids i will quote from genesis chapter 4 where God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door, but you can master over it. The Hebrew verb there is Timishel. You can master it. You can master it. Cain doesn't master it. He gives him to the temptation to kill his brother, the, what I call the unspeakable pleasure of violence. Um, it's up to you. That's what I would say to that young man. Yeah. You are responsible for your own life. Let's see. I'd like to, uh, you know, and clearly the parents have been uh, hurting these children, young adults. I mean, they're not even children at that point. We're talking about extreme extended adolescence. You know, uh, whereas when I was in high school, you know, you turn 18 and you were looking to get out on your own as quickly as possible. I, I moved out uh, two weeks uh, before my 18th birthday. Uh, needless to say, my parents didn't give me any proper guidance or anything, and I ended up in a big mess. But, you know, over the years, I figured it out and worked it out myself. But, you know, this is <clears throat> extreme coddling. Well, and people look at the title, The Collapse of Parenting, and they think I'm blaming parents. I'm really not. If you read the book, you'll find I'm blaming the culture. American culture now undermines the role of parents and gives no guidance to the kids. Again, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, a kid who grew up watching the Andy Griffith show, even if his parents were lousy parents who never talked about right and wrong, if he just watched American television, he was watching shows like I Love Lucy and the Andy Griffith show, he was getting very clear guidance about what is right and what is wrong and what is expected of you. But that's no longer the case. Now the kid who's spending hours watching television is not watching the Andrew Griffith show. He's watching the Disney Channel and he's watching Modern Family and he's not getting any guidance about the virtue of hard work, telling the truth. On the contrary, uh, on iCarly and American Idol, what he's learning is that winning and being famous matters more than anything else. Being kind is not important. Again, this is not a guess. Researchers at UCLA looked at the most popular television shows from 1967 through today, and they found that from 1967 through 1997, the shows were consistently teaching that being kind and being a good person was the most important thing. 
being famous was the least important thing. In 10 years, between 1997 and 2007, they show American culture flipped upside down. And suddenly being kind went from top to bottom and being famous went from bottom to top. Wow. American culture changed. And if it's all about, you know, on, on Survivor or American Idol, being kind, that's not important. What's important is winning. And that's something very new in American culture. And it is immensely toxic because if winning is the most important thing and being famous is the most important thing, then most of you are going to be anxious and depressed because most of you are not going to be famous millionaires. Most of us are not. And the result is that that person working an everyday job for an hourly wage feels like I'm a failure. And that I see that all the time. All right. I wanted to uh, shift uh, here to your book, Why Gender Matters. And uh, why is gender important and what is gender? And, and, you know, most people don't realize. They think, oh, well, you know, if you just cut it off, suddenly you're a, a girl or whatever. But, you know, there's 65, minimum 6,500 differences between boys and girls. And it's not just about genitalia. No, not at all. And, again, that's a major focus of the book. I devote a chapter to sex differences in hearing, vision, and smell. It turns out that for many odors, a girl or a woman has a sense of smell that much, is much better than a boy's or man's sense of smell. Well, how much better? 50% uh, better? Uh, twice as sensitive? No, for many odors, it's 100,000 times difference. So a man and a woman both walk into a room and, and the woman says, oh my gosh, something died and it rotted. I think I'm going to throw up. And the man says, I don't smell anything. And they look at each other in amazement. How could you not smell that? And the man says, what are you smelling? Uh, they don't realize they are experiencing different sensory worlds. No one has ever taught them this. So again, there are robust sex differences, not only across every culture, but across species. I show that these differences have been documented not only in humans, but in uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, monkeys, even in laboratory rats. Um, sex differences are profound across mammals and they affect everything from risk taking to how we see the world uh, and parents and teachers need to know that uh, another example you give kids a blank piece of paper give give seven-year-olds a blank piece of paper and a box of crayons and ask them to draw whatever they want i cite studies from the united states from england from south africa from uh, Jap japan and from thailand and which researchers did just that. It's called free drawing. Give children three years old, seven years old, 10 years old, a blank piece of paper and a box of crayons. What do girls draw? Girls everywhere draw people, pets, flowers, and trees, usually two, three, or four, arranged on a horizontal ground. The people have eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. What do boys draw? Well, boys actually are complicated. About one in 12 boys draw what the girls draw. They draw people, pets, and trees. And people have eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. Turns out that boys who draw people, pets, and trees have a lot in common with other boys. In each of these studies, about 8 to 10% of boys draw people, pets, and trees. Turns out that boys who draw people, pets, and trees are at least three times more likely than other boys to have allergies, asthma, or eczema sufficiently severe to warrant ongoing consultation with a doctor. Uh, they may be athletic, but they're not playing football or hockey, they're playing tennis, track, or golf because they don't like to hit or to be hit. And they're much more likely to become victims of bullying because a favorite game among 12-year-old boys is one boy comes up to the other boy and says, hey, how about I hit you as hard as I can and then you hit me as hard as you can? And this boy will say, but I don't want to hit you and I don't want you to hit me. And he runs off and boom, marks himself as a victim of bullying. He is not necessarily more likely to be homosexual. Sexual orientation is a separate parameter. This boy who loves football and hockey turns out to be a gay boy. This boy here who doesn't want to hit or be hit and would rather draw a picture of a flower turns out to be straight. Gender is complicated, but just because gender is complicated doesn't mean gender doesn't matter. What happens when you give a blank piece of paper to a boy and ask him to draw whatever he wants? More than 90% of boys 
will draw a scene of action at a moment of dynamic change, like a monster eating an alien or rocket smashing into a planet. Human figures at present are stick figures, lacking eyes, mouth, hair, and clothes. The boys use six or fewer crayons with a predominance of black, gray, silver, and blue. The girls use 10 or more crayons with a predominance of red, orange, yellow, green, beige, and brown. This is a robust empirical finding. Um, and this is not a cultural construct. Boys are not doing this because they've been taught that this is boy, what boys do. On the contrary, boys are doing this despite the fact that the teacher has said, Jason, a car crash. Why do you want to draw a car crash? People are going to get killed and injured. Look at Emily's picture. It's so nice. No one's getting killed or paralyzed. You know, they have to draw something so violent. Boys are not drawing the, this because they've been taught to. They're drawing this in spite of Right. Well, you know, and, and for men... Our, at our core is provide and protect, you know, so and and now uh, boys in school are taught it's not okay to draw swords or guns or anything like that. In fact, you know, won't they even get suspended for that? Yes, and indeed, uh, I've written a, a number of articles in Boys Adrift. I talk about uh, one boy, uh, uh, these are 10 year old boys in a fifth grade classroom, and one of the boys pointed his finger at another boy and said, bang. And the other boy pretended to pull back a bow and arrow and went, gotcha. Both boys were referred to the principal and the principal suspended one of the boys because it violated their zero tolerance policy on violence. Uh, and what is happening? As, as the attorney, uh, uh, pro bono attorney, uh, sued the district to get the boy's record cleared. And the attorney said, you are criminalizing the imagination. There was no weapon here. He was pretending. There was, it was his fingers. Right, well, and it's emasculating uh, male behavior as well. Boys doing things that boys have always done, like pointing fingers at one another saying, bang, bang, you're dead, now gets them in trouble at many schools. And what's the unintended consequence? The unintended consequence is boys who say school sucks. School is for girls. Academic achievement has become unmasculine for American boys. And one big reason for that is that school has taught them that caring about what the teacher says and wants is something girls do. That real boys are defiant and disrespectful. This is what American schools have inadvertently done with their zero tolerance policy. Uh, again, this is a big change. I attended public schools in Northern Ohio, K through 12. And I, I attended Lomond Elementary School in Shaker Heights, Ohio. And I remember throughout, we get a lot of snow coming off Lake Erie, lake effect snow. And I remember throughout the winter months at lunch and at recess, we'd put on our coats and we'd go outside uh, and we'd throw snowballs at each other. And the teachers would come out and join us, students against teachers. I remember Mr. Albers was a great shot. He'd get you right in the forehead every time. Uh, but now at American schools, two kids throwing snowballs at each other. Teacher's going to run out and say, what are you guys doing? You're not to do that here. You, you got to wait till after school and go somewhere else. Never allowed to throw snowballs on school grounds. And the unintended message that is being sent is that school is not for you. You want to do things that boys have always done? Go somewhere else. You don't belong here at school. And boys are getting that message loud and clear. Changes in the school environment is one of the five factors that has driven this growing epidemic of boys who would rather play video games and do well in school. Because the video games, Fortnite, Call of Duty, Grand Theft Auto, they totally get it. You want to shoot other people? We get that. That's what this game is all about. Wow. And uh, let's... Uh... And we can uh, wrap it up after this question. How is <clears throat> transgenderism ideology not science? Okay, so I'm very cautious about how I approach this topic. I Look, in the first edition of Why Gender Matters, published in 2005, I had about one page on transgender, uh, about three quarters of a page. The publisher, Penguin Random House, invited me to write a revised edition. Uh, which I agreed to do, was published last year. I spent a year writing the revision. The revised edition has four chapters devoted to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and gender nonconforming. In 1994, the American Psychiatric Association, in one of their publications, raised and answered the question, how common is transgender? 
1994, the American Psychiatric Association said, well, it's so rare. We can only estimate what we estimate. It's fewer than one in 30,000, fewer than one in 30,000 individuals are transgender. Last year, Time Magazine had a cover story titled Beyond He or She about the new transgender And it's movement, all in social they, engineering pushed they, out of SRI, they, et cetera. They, they, they surveyed 2,000 millennials, 12% of whom said that they were in some respect transgender. So we went from, in, in just over 20 years, we went from fewer than one in 10,000 to more than one in 10. What happened? What is transgender? And why this explosion in incidents? Is transgender a normal variation? Okay. Well, I define, I say, in order to answer that question, we have to define what we mean by normal. Okay, I'm going to speak as a medical doctor. I've been a medical doctor for 32 years. Let's define normal. Normal means you don't require any medication or surgery to fulfill your potential, to live your best life. So 100 years ago, doctors used to think that being left-handed was a pathology, that it was abnormal. But then throughout the 20th century, researchers said, you know what, 7% of people are left-handed. And it's not abnormal. It is uncommon, only 7%. But it is a normal variation. Being left-handed is a normal variation. It is not abnormal. A left-handed person does not require medication or surgery in order to fulfill their potential. They might need left-handed scissors instead of right-handed scissors. That's a minor modification. It's a lifestyle modification. It is not a medication or a surgery. I think that definition of normal, which is generally accepted among medical doctors, that a normal variation is any variation that doesn't require medication or surgery, I think that's a good definition. And I explain that definition at length in my book, Why Gender Matters. Okay. This boy says, I am a girl trapped in the body of a boy. A transgender individual, that XY male who has a penis and testicles, but who tells you that he is a girl trapped in the body of a boy. If we are going to say, okay, yes, you're a transgender, uh, he's going to require surgery and prescription medication, female hormones, in order to live the life he says he wants to live. But is he really transgender? If a six-year-old boy comes to his parents and says, I'm a girl trapped in the body of a boy, is he transgender? Well, once again, we have longitudinal cohort studies. Dr. Kenneth Zucker, has spent the last 30 years studying these individuals and has a cohort of over a thousand of such individuals that he's been following for 30 years. What is the most likely outcome of a six-year-old boy who tells you, I am a girl trapped in the body of a boy? 15 years down the road, when he's now 21 years of age, what is he most likely to say to you? He is most likely to say, I am a gay man. He doesn't want to be a woman. He doesn't think he's a woman. He has discovered that he is a gay man. The m next most likely outcome is he is a straight man who loves ballet and macrame. He is gender nonconforming, but he is a straight man who has, is sexually interested only in women. Those are the most likely outcomes. It is very rare, very rare that 15 years down the road, that young man sa still says, I am a woman trapped in the body of a man. And yet, it is now common for American parents to say, oh, you're six years old. How can you tell if that six-year-old is going to grow up to be a gay man or a straight man yes. or transgender? Well, how can you determine? You cannot determine. And it you could be a phase. Ask, you cannot ask a six-year-old about their sexual orientation. Look, I remember when I was seven years old, asking my you're, mom. You're barely in the camera there. Uh, okay, whoops. I asked my mom, if I marry a woman, will I have to take off my pajamas with her? And my mom said, yes, but you'll want to. I said, no, I won't. Yeah, girls have cooties. 
and I'm a straight man. Asking a seven-year-old about their sexual orientation is not meaningful. Sex, seven-year-olds don't have a sexual agenda, nor should they. Right. That six-year-old has no way of knowing what their sexual orientation will be. Neither they or their parents have the foggiest clue. And, and it is malpractice, pure and simple, to subject that prepubescent child to hormonal treatment. It shouldn't be done. The right. evidence is strongly against it. Look, I recently saw a teenager who was born a girl who still has her ovaries, but she has transitioned to the male role. So we're now supposed to address her as Jason. She is taking birth control pills to suppress her periods and high doses of testosterone to masculinize her appearance. What do we know? about the outcomes of an individual who is taking both birth control pills with high doses of female hormones and high doses of testosterone. What published research is there on such teenagers? The answer is zero. There is no published research. In the transgender community, they refer to these kids as pioneers. I call them guinea pigs. Right, absolutely. They're being subjected to, to hormonal treatment whose outcomes are unknown. We don't know if there's going to be an increased risk of blood clots, certainly sterility, uh, anxiety, depression. We don't know. These kids are guinea pigs. And, and that's, the, that's the agenda. You know, my whole opinion, and, and I see the media and social engineering promoting all of this stuff, but, you know, another thing about the six-year-old is, you know, let's say the six-year-old six has a little sister born, and then the parents are suddenly giving more attention to this new infant in the family. And the six-year-old thinks, well, if I'm a little girl, maybe I'll get more attention or something like that. Okay. That, okay, Dr. Zucker again has looked at why does this kid say he is transgender? The scenario you just described is very unusual. What is more common, Dr. Zucker finds, is that this boy is being beaten up by bullies either in his own family or elsewhere and he sees that the older boy bully doesn't hit girls but he does hit boys wow. and the boy thinks if i'm a girl i won't be bullied another common scenario that dr zucker has documented is the boy hears his father say i'd rather my son be dead than be gay well if the son has heard that and he incorporates that he doesn't want to be gay. He doesn't want to acknowledge that he might be gay because his father has repeatedly said, I'd rather my son be dead than be gay. But if I'm actually a girl, maybe that's okay. So internalized homophobia is a common mechanism Dr. Zucker has documented that is driving some of these transgender individuals. What, what about the, uh, the choice itself of this behavior, though? You know, look, gender is complicated. Figuring out whether you're gay or straight can be complicated. And the big surprise is that figuring out whether you're male or female is not hardwired. Yeah, it well, is you just, much well, more much more fragile. And you have than, these these sorry to we, inter yeah, you have these social justice warriors going around saying uh, doctors are who declare what gender you yeah. are, not yeah. the way you're born gender in your mother's womb. Gender is not womb. assigned. Gender is recognized. Right. But so many uh, women who now in their 40s, 50s, and 60s have said, hey, you know, when I was growing up, I hated dresses. I hated pink. All I wanted to do was uh, uh, wrestle and, and wrestle hogs and, and climb trees and throw things. And these women say... I'm a woman. There's more than one way to be a girl. And just because this girl hates pink and likes to wear overalls and wrestle hogs doesn't mean she's a boy. And the ironic result of this promotion of transgenderism is a reinforcement of gender stereotypes. That if this girl doesn't like dolls and doesn't like pink, maybe she's trans. That's insane. She's not trans. She's a tomboy. There's more than one way. Right, right. And that used to be perfectly recognized when I was younger. 
Dr. Sachs, thank you so much for the uh, very enlightening uh, show. I hope a lot of parents as well as uh, children and young adults out there that are caught in all of this, you know, stop and think about what they're doing and, uh, you know, just just think things through and, you know, start being parents uh, for those who are they're, you know, playing video games and watching porn. Think about breaking your video game machines, taking a bat to it and deleting all your porn. And, you know, it's it's like, uh, you know, a few years ago, what was that uh, South Park movie or play or whatever? The Internet is for porn. I forget who put that out, you know. But, you know, now you, you do a search online, unless you have safe search on or something, this crap yep. is likely to show up. So, you know, start blocking this out of your lives. Start focusing on your... To- be in charge. Right. You know, take charge. Take charge of your own lives. If you're an adult living at home, maybe stop and think a second and think, is, you know, is this the best choice that I should be making? So thanks to all of you in the chat for participating. Thanks to Uncommon for the donation and uh, anybody else who donated today. I much appreciate all of your support. Thank you again, Dr. Sachs, for your great work. And uh, maybe we can have you back sometime. And I really appreciate your time today. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you.